Hey, everybody, I always hate that cut just before we go live. I'm about to find some way to make that not happen. Hey, hey, welcome to uh, today's uh, interactive, interaction, uh, uh, tongue tied, Air Edition Network interactive Black History and Knowledge session. We're a little bit late getting on here today. I had some things that were going on, um, trying to rush in here and get it done, but uh, we are here, we are on, and I am excited about today. I'm actually a little bit more amped up than my usual self. Um, you know, I've been, uh, eh, I wouldn't say down a little bit lately, but I have been um, preoccupied. I think that's the word, right? That's the word that I'll use. <laughs> preoccupied with a lot of different things that are going on um in my life and in everything that's happening. Hey, um, we're on today uh, trying to go over some uh, very, very, in my opinion, important history. Uh, you know, every year around this time, uh, it's actually going to happen, I believe, Monday, right? Uh, there is a celebration of, yes, Columbus Day. Now, in certain places inside of the country, They've now called it Indigenous People Day, but, you know, for the majority of us, it is called Columbus Day. And so uh, we're going to we're going to hit some history here today. Uh, I will tell you that the schema or the model for this show has always been that we try very hard to have an interactive um, program and to present um information to you uh, that you can ask questions and get involved and things like that. Uh, and we're going to do that today. That's still going to be a part of what we're doing. However, one of the things I am going to do today is I'm, I'm really going to take some time to break out this history um, for us and for different folks out here, um, because I want us to all start to think about how we got to where we are and why this whole Columbus Day thing is so important, um, should be important to us as African-American, as black people. Um, I don't know how many we will get. I see we have a couple of people that are on right now, and I can't always see everybody that's on. But And I encourage you to go on to StreamYard and um, click it for... Uh, Facebook, so that if you do ask questions on Facebook and for YouTube, um, I could be able to see your questions. You know, usually what happens with this program is that probably about 15, 20 minutes into it, people start to realize that we're on. <laughs> and then they all start logging on or I start to see people uh, getting in from work and different things like that. So I'm not going to belabor and, and wait on a lot of people today to uh, to get on but I am going to uh, go forward in our lesson for today. So, as I said, we wanted to cover some things about um, Columbus. Now, I know many of us uh, have this thing, right, where we see um, Columbus as a uh, um, something that we're taught in school. Right. And it is taught to us over and over again, very early in our academic careers uh, as students from the age of, from kindergarten on. We are taught that Columbus discovered America. And the, the nuance of that uh, is lost on young people, because in truth, uh, when we're taught, when, we're, when those things are said, we don't. Um, we don't know what you know, what not to trust, right? Uh, our, 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 our parents, our grandparents, different individuals ha uh, were taught uh, this, so they pass it on to us. And if you ask a majority of people, they can actually tell you what year that Columbus discovered America. And, I, and I'll put that out there to you. Can anybody who's online right now tell me what year that, that you're taught that Columbus discovered the Americas? Easy question. Easy throw out question out there for you right now for everybody to answer. 
Uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds on it as I go forward. I'll be waiting for your answer. But anyway, we're taught that Columbus discovered America um, and bought civilization. As a matter of fact, when you study um, the 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 uh, information that's out here on uh, on early history, they call it Western civilization. That's the term. Now, that term may go over your head and it may not seem like much, but when you consider the fact that, what, what is that saying? Western civilization. That saying, right, when civilization, civil, right, when you were taught, not Western culture, Western civilization, that you were civilized, that this, this culture over here was given an understanding a European understanding. I see some people answering. I asked, when was Columbus, when do you learn in school that Columbus uh, discovered America? Then he says 1619. See, that just shows you how how the, the, the situations of today uh, mark our thoughts and understanding of history. It is not 1619. Hey, I see my nephews on here. No, first grade at least. Oh, you must be talking about when you know, when you first hear about it. <laughs> Sean Anthony said 1492. Absolutely correct. They tell us that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and he discovered what we now know to be America or the Americas. Well, that's a load of malarkey, right? Is that, that's how they say it. That's crap. In fact, right? Uh, there is a whole lead up to Columbus that is often ignored. And as we go into this idea of Western civilization, as I just said a moment ago, and this is why I told people, if you're going to miss today's show, you're going to miss some things because I'm about to get into this, right? There's so much malarkey, bull thrown out here uh, about Columbus and how things uh, were found. And I want to kind of go um into that sorry my something was falling off my thing here i want to go into that i want i want to touch on how all of this took place right so let's get into it what we talked about the civilization what we're talking about is european mentality european understanding of history and whether you know it or not young old whatever you have been taught western civilization uh, European history. You are still taught European history, but we're here to teach you black history and to show you how that European history has been manipulated for thousands of years. And we're going to go through, because I put a timeline here. That's what you see me look over this. So I'm looking at my timeline that I wrote as my notes. So let's talk about that. From 40,000, 40,000 to 7,000, they used to call it before Christ, right? But they don't call it that anymore. They, they call it now BCE, which is called before the common era, right? So 40,000 years to 7,000 years is what a lot of historians are told are telling you was prehistory. In other words, not documented history. So we can't prove that these things actually happened or they didn't happen. And so that has a lot to do what happened in, the, in that period of time. We're talking about uh, the, 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 the migration of blacks and Africans out of Africa, the, the African diaspora, the original African diaspora. We're talking about uh, the diaspora. We're, we're, we're talking about the people coming over initially into the Americas, right? Uh, they tell us around that time that this is when the Bering Strait happened. Remember, I know a lot of you guys get taught that in school. And there was an ice. The ice age was still going on. So there was ice at the top part of, of North America. And people walked over from what is now Russia and, and over in other eastern parts of, of the world. And they walked over that strait. And they came into the Americas. They talk about how people also came. If you look at the maps, I showed this a couple of, a couple of months ago. Uh, Everything that they showed in migration showed people coming from different areas except Africa. Now, I'm going to tell you why that's, why that's illogical. 
One, if you tell me that everything up top was frozen, and if we also understand that the world was a little bit more tighter then, we talk about Pangea and different things like that, then you also understand that people could have sailed over at the bottom because it was warmer climate. We also know that, that, that civilization stay very close to coastal lines. That is because they were afraid to kind of go more inside. And as they were travelers, they stayed around the waters and walked around the coast and navigated the coast of these continents. So that meant that they also learned to fish. They also learned to operate and do things outside the sea. We know this historically, but we're not told that in prehistory. As a matter of fact, majority of the time, they just tell us that people crossed over during the Ice Age. They don't talk about any of the things that really happened. And when they do, they always try to talk about the European, the Mediterranean. They never talk about Africa in your studies. And if I'm wrong, somebody please chat up and say that I'm wrong. But I know because I do a lot of reading and I've done a lot of study and I've heard this over and over and over for decades that this is what is taught. So that is the prehistoric before history. And then we get into this idea of now people are traveling around. So now we're talking about uh, 4500 to 1780 BCE. What is also known as the Sumerian Mesopotamian era, right? Where uh, they focus on the Middle East. Modern folks focus on the Middle East. They talk about uh, things that happen over in areas like Saudi Arabia and what we now know as Iran and Iraq, which interestingly was a part of Africa by terms of the way that the ancient people saw the world. It was a part of Africa. Africa just wasn't this one continent. The Middle East didn't exist until there was a reason to separate the idea of these brown and black people, people of color. And that, be that happened because of a European edict to separate those folks. We'll touch on that a little bit later. But when we don't include Africa, then we take away from everything that was going on in Africa around that time, right? We take away from the ideas that were passed um, by kingdoms in Babylon, by uh, earlier kingdoms in Egypt, uh, by the Nubians, by different cultures who occupied that area. And we just blow them off as if they to say, well, they were Middle Eastern but they were a part of African and, and, and black history. Because of this, we are not given credit, blacks are not given credit for the bronze. You say, well, what does that mean? Bronze, there's, we call it a bronze age. This was the age of discovery, of metalworking. We know that the early uh, uh, Egyptians, Nubians, Sumerians, uh, people of Mesopotamia, they, they knew how to work metals. We know this because you can go back and look at the ancient Egyptian uh, artifacts that are being dug up from those eras and you see how well they worked metals and use them in every part of their lives. The Benin people who are often, and the Nubians who are often talked about as being slave traders in the modern age, blacks who traded their own people, were before that were renowned for their ability to work metal. What's so funny is this is actually, I saw this actually written and talked about in our school books, but it's very, it's, it's one line and we don't go into it. When you talk about the Bronze Age, we give credit to the Egyptians. We give credit to the upper African people. And there's a reason, because we want to show the Mediterranean, the European influence on those cultures and say they had a part in that when they really did not. So we move from that to the Egyptian era. And let's go again and talk about why do you think, and that's another question. There's a question out here because I've been talking for a little bit. Why do we give so much emphasis on Egypt 
more than any other nation or culture in Africa, both ancient and today. Can anybody answer me that? Give me your opinion. Why do you think so much is focused on Egypt? I'll give you a couple of seconds to answer that question. Anybody? Nobody? <laughs> That's fine. I know there's a slight delay. Well, I'll say this while you guys are trying to formulate an answer for that. My nephew said pyramids. Yeah, there's some emphasis. There's some, some thoughts on pyramids. People are interested in that. Um, but what else? Why do you think that, uh, give me another thing. Why do you think that uh, we spend so much time um, focused on Egypt more than any other place. Hieroglyphics. All right, maybe I'm a little confused. I'm confusing y'all a little bit. I, my point is, why do we always say, well, we had Egypt? Because it stimulates sort of, of the civilization it is like today. It simulates sort of. Eh. Christopher said, you said a European control. You're close. Yes. European control does have a part to play in this. The Ptolemy family, right? And how was an example. If we go further, but even before that, Egypt always opened itself up to other cultures across the Med. The Med, I've been in the Med in my life several times, is a very narrow place comparatively to certain parts of the world. And it's not hard to get in a ship and sail across over into African waters from Europe. And so a lot of invasions happen within Egypt. And this plays a part as we get closer and closer and closer to the understanding of Columbus, because let's not forget what we're really talking about here today. Egypt advancement from 5000 to 332 BCE, right? As my nephew said, they built pyramids, even though those pyramids we have found in history were inspired by the Nubians. The Nubians who built smaller functional pyramids and places for their dead. Even though we know, right? Historically, that the Egyptian and the Somali, the Nubian, they were all the same. How do we know that? Because ancient texts, right? Ancient things that were written by historians of that time called them such. They were Kushites. They were black men. They were sons of Ham. They were Ethiopian. They were Somalian. They were Nubian. But at any time and any characteristic, they were people of a dark skin. And they weren't seen as ugly, and they weren't seen as stupid. They were loved. They, they were honored. Rather, you look at the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, who were Phoenicians, the African Phoenicians, who I've talked about many times before. All, all of these things in Africa, along the coast, these people were people who sailed all over the world, who connected with other climates, other people. But the weakness and the reason why people focus so much in the European world on Egypt is because Egypt was freely giving itself. It was the Mecca, the, man, the meeting place of African and Mediterranean European grouping. And so much knowledge was passed in its libraries and its, and its knowledge and it, over and over and over again that in, people didn't see these folks as invaders. They saw them as another culture coming in. But it wasn't until the age of the Macedonian age where you see Alexander coming in, right? And these folks saying, now we're liberators. We're liberating you to learn. Well, what are you liberating? You're, you're not rediscovering, you're not liberating. And that's a thing. But then let's go further, right? Let's look at the Hebrews, the Bible. Most of you all, I, I've, I've been raised, some of you raised in church, and you know the Bible. From 2500 BCE to about 30, 30, let's say 40 BCE, 
what used to be called BC before Christ. Africans played a significant part in the Bible and their functions with Hebrews, Canaanites, Phoenicians, David talks about him. Solomon talks about him. Songs of Solomon, there's actual chapter of Songs of Solomon where he's talking to his black wife, where it's a, it's a poem showing the beauty of this black woman. Over and over again, we are in the Hebrew environment. Blacks, Africans are mentioned over and over again, and knowledge is passed through Egypt, through different parts of Africa, Help is given over and over and over again. And this is the part that black people play. But let's move forward. If Egypt is the Mecca that everybody is meeting, who's meeting with the, with the Egyptians? The Greeks. So from 1220 to possibly about 150 BCE, the Greeks start taking things out of Egypt, out of Africa. They start writing myths in the form of the stories that the Africans used to tell. They start philosophizing and deep thinking. They start to do things that they learned in Egypt, that they learned in Libya, that they learned from the Carthaginians. They start to do things because of the inspiration that is given from, and when I say Africa, I'm talking about all along what you now think is the Middle East. All of this knowledge, information is passed. The Phoenician alphabet is one of the first alphabets. Then the Greeks came and copied that alphabet to create their own alphabet. They, they took part of the religion, the theology, the science, the religions, not just what you think of gods, but even the idea of the Hebrew God. There's evidence that the Greeks even saw that and took that and put into some stories. They, they worked metal. They took part in what they call the Bronze Age. They expanded the Bronze Age and then took it and based that to be able to go into the Iron Age. And then later on, the Romans took from them. 1753 to 31 BCE, the Romans came in. The first Roman Republic took all of the ideas, even the gods and the ideas, from the Greeks who had taken theirs from the Egyptians and by proxy from the Africans. They were credited with writing laws and things we base our laws on. They were credited with engineering. They were credited with all of these things. And this knowledge was because of the shared idea of that area in the world. It didn't happen out of nowhere. But unfortunately, the Romans decided to increase a warlike behavior. So from 43 BCE to possibly around 40, 480 BCE, we saw then what became the Roman Empire elitist, murderers, killers. All of these folks, right, came in and infected a new mentality in the world. They took the religions and they decided to make those religions the reason behind their conquest, the reason behind what they could do to others to, to have dominion, domination over those other cultures. And we see that tracing even in the known as we move into the known world the romans even went in from 4 to 30 ce what we used to call ad or in other words the common era and why do we call it the common era what happened from 4 bce to 30 ce Historically, what happened was Jesus. Jesus was born and killed in that period of time. And from that period, right, things changed. A new religion, a new mentality was born. 
We forget that the Romans were so steeped in conquering and murder and death and domination and elitism, the Caesars and the Senate and everybody and taking knowledge from all over the world, fighting with the Carthaginians, the African Phoenicians for trade routes, all the way up to the Britons, all the way to what we see as the UK today. They wanted to dominate. And they did this for so long at the at the almost at the risk of their own destruction until their own empire collapsed under the treachery and evil and 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 things that they were doing within this so-called amazing state. And so the Romans declined. And we had warlords in the Eastern Plains. We had people like Attila the Hun and different folks that came in. We had the Vandals who came in and sacked Rome. And it was not until, it was not until Constantine, 312, Constantine became the, the Roman emperor and he approved Christianity. But he only approved Christianity because it wasn't the Christianity of old. It was the Christianity of conquering. Using the Bible, using Christ as something to fight for, as something to restrict others with. And so what we found in that time, 312, 330, when Christianity became a state religion, right? What we found was a a, a period of time where people basically were forced into a mentality that you could not study science. You could not do anything because, because the church did not allow it. The state did not allow it. Shafti said religion became a weapon to justify the violent tendencies, even though it was meant for peace. Actually, that is absolutely true. And unfortunately, unfortunately, right? We ran into this situation where we went into a dark age. The church was used to tell everybody what they couldn't do. And if you look through the Middle Ages, if you look through the Crusades, if you look through the Inquisitions, the use of religion to be able to harm others, right? And this went on and on for centuries. Now, we say, well, Eddie, why are we covering all of this? When science is frowned upon, you can't even study the stars because someone tells you that Jesus, that God would not allow you to do that. But people who studied the stars wanted to study to understand the glory and the, and the splendor of God. Many early scientists or people who looked to the stars were religious men and women. But unfortunately, this is what happened. Governments, kings, kingdoms took over. Knowledge was lost. Knowledge was withheld. There's another nefarious issue with that too. We don't want to talk about the issues of the, the, the Moors, the Muslims, the Ottomans, the Turks. We don't want to talk about the, the uh, Africans. We don't want to talk about where this knowledge came from. We want to usurp that knowledge, take it for ourselves and say we came up with it so we can hide it. What's so remarkable is that this went on for so long, for so long, that man, most people, they weren't able to read, think. The priests were the only ones allowed to read the Bible and other books. If you wanted something deciphered or read, you took it to a priest. And they were under an official vow to not share anything 
that would knock the religion. And it wasn't until 1337, the Renaissance. Young people out there, when you're taught about the Renaissance, what are you taught? What do they tell you about the Renaissance? I want you to answer that question as I go forward, as I keep going. But when the Renaissance started, the paintings, the art, the, the, the going back to uh, Greek and Roman uh, thoughts, philosoph philosophies, sculptures, paintings, the thought process, philosophies. You know, the Greeks sat here for quite some time, right? Uh, you had the, 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 the um, Pythagoras, math. You had uh, Hippocrates, right? Uh, dealing with, with, with medicine. You had the sophists. You had Socrates. You, the people we still hear about today, but the knowledge did not start with them. They were people who received the knowledge. Teddy said, we're taught about art and scholarly thinking. They tell you that the Renaissance was the beginning of the age of enlightenment. Where people were enlightened. That's what they tell you. And unfortunately, unfortunately, what they don't, what they tend to leave out is that Renaissance means, means what? What does the name Renaissance mean? Rebirth, revisit, right? The ability to go back and retouch on something. That's what Renaissance means. However, we're not taught that in school. Like he just said, we're taught that it's art and scholarly thinking. Right? Anybody else have a thought on what the Renaissance, what you're taught about the Renaissance? Nothing. That's fine. <laughs> I know this is a lot to unpack. I know this is a lot to unpack, but we have to understand this history. I spent the last 30 minutes going and tracing us through a historical marker, giving you dates, giving you things to say and to do, uh, or I'm sorry, things that you to understand. So you understand what they said and what they did about this time. But the Renaissance was important because what they did was they gave advancement a European mentality. There is a religious shift. Yes. Because see, what happened after during the Renaissance is that people thought, oh my God, you are going into paganism again. You are touching because there was still a fear of where this comes from. You're going back into these, 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 these blacks. These, the, the, we don't want to touch that. The church had, from Constantine's time to that time, had been told, we don't want to talk about those things. Because there is a part to hide who we are. And I, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, I, anyone who is Catholic, I have to be honest with, your hist with the history of that, of that church. Many papal bulls were written for thousands of years to withhold knowledge that came from brown, red, and black people. They were seen as the other, something that was savage, something that had to be subjugated, something that had to be brought back to God in a way that the European, the Europe, let's specify, saw God as something that could be used to dominate. So when we had the war uh, uh, with, after the Renaissance, right, and we had issues that happened with the church fighting against the things that were being exposed by the Renaissance, right? When that happened, <laughs> all hell broke loose. You had Joan of Arc saying that she was talking to angels and, and, and God was talking to her. You had so the Magnificent going out and having art and things done to reflect David, different things from the Bible. And the world went crazy. 
We have Michelangelo, Da Vinci. We had all of these people who came in and wanted to have knowledge. The Renaissance is not just art and literature. It was a re-engagement into science, but with a European twist. And because of that, it caused a different way of thinking, as Chris said, religious shift. It led us to reformation. It led us to reformation. 1485 to 1648 where there was a separation from the Catholic Church and the understanding of what was being hid. Thank you, brother. Now, we get into Columbus and why I went over all of this. Columbus, Columbus, Columbus. Columbus came in 1492, as Sean Anthony alluded to before. He came because he had already had previous knowledge of the Americas. A lot of historians don't like to talk about that. They don't want us to even think about that, right? They, they tell you that Columbus uh, found the Americas. But Columbus didn't find anything. He knew it was here. There are certain things about Columbus's life that are very interesting to me. Did you know that Columbus spent time in Ghana, in Africa? That's not usually taught. He, he spent time in Ghana. He also knew and spent time talking with the Portuguese. He understood the Spanish and the Portuguese. It's very hard to even tell for people to really understand, was Columbus a Spanish? Was he Portuguese? What, what was he? Historians debate. But what we do know is that Columbus traveled over here. And we say there's lies, right? The lie that he, he sailed because the world, to prove the world <laughs> wasn't flat. That's a lie. That was made up in a story. The Edgar Burroughs made that story up to sell books. History, history tells us that he went over it because he, he was following the spice trade. That's an interesting point to make. Because, see, the Portuguese did a lot of, 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 of trade with Phoenician, uh, Muslim, Turks, people in the East. People in the East knew. They knew. I, or I told somebody recently, the appearance of map shows coasts of the Americas at a high level. What do I mean by that? Though the map is drawn out as if you were elevated looking down on the coast. Go look it up. And it traces all of those waters. But we're told that Columbus found the Americas. Do you know that the first place that Columbus landed on was called Guanahani? Guanahani. And if if that is not an indicator that Columbus knew, right, what was going on, you only have to consider the fact that the Africans, right, that's what they called their gold. South Africans called their gold their gold. When, when Columbus arrived, the Tianos, which they later called the Arawaks, the black men, told them that black men had traveled, had come over from the south and the east, and they had come in and taught them how to shape their metal. That's what we're talking about earlier. Because the Benin people were world renowned as aloe and metal and gold and tin copper molders guanine is the name that africans gave their gold because guanine has a smell africans would put spices in their gold and they would smell their gold columbus was told this and the land that he landed on the native tongue of it was guanahani 
So he knew where he was going. To also top on to that, and I've said this before, when Columbus arrived, he said he saw a light. That's how he knew land was coming. He said he saw a light that looked like a candle, something flashing out. Interesting. Always has interested me because before he saw the land, he saw a light and knew that that's the way to go, that and the birds. But that's a lie. They knew exactly where they were going. They tell, I agree, they tell you that he was looking for a place, a new route to India without paying tax. No. The Portuguese already knew where India was. The Portuguese had already, Prince Henry the Navigator had already supposedly sailed around the coast of Africa, even though he wasn't the first African Phoenicians that sailed around it 500 BC. But it was said that Prince Henry the Navigator sailed around the coast, right? So if he sailed around the coast of Africa and he knew this, and this was 1439, at Columbus, as we said, sailed over in 1492, that doesn't make any logical sense that they wouldn't know where India and where these other places were. But that's not what you're taught in your history books. You're given a lie, a myth, to accept Western civilization and the idea of domination, of being bought civ civility to the savage. Teddy said, was looking over my brother's schoolwork, and the new thing is Columbus was in search of Asia. <laughs> All of these things are lies, ladies and gentlemen. And sadly, historians, many of them know it. Many of them know it. Columbus knew what he was looking for. How do we know that? Because when Columbus actually got over to the islands, to uh, Guani, Guanihani, he made a comment because, see, this is the thing. Columbus wrote down everything. He wrote, he had an explicit journal on what was going on because he wanted Queen Isabella and Fernand to be able to know what he was doing. He, want, he wanted them to know what was going on, it, that there was, their money was backing. And he was, he was told to do that. So that's what Columbus did. He wrote everything down without a lie, and he sent it back. And it was printed and sent all over Europe. Because this was around the time also of coming into what we just said earlier was the Reformation, where books and things were being printed, languages were being sent after, after the uh, uh, um, Renaissance all over the world. So a lot of those things got into history before they could hide them. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? Because obviously it showcases the fact that there was a premeditated idea that it was a premeditated idea to conquer. As a matter of fact, when Columbus first saw the Tiano people, one of the things that he said was, they are conquerable. He saw one of the slaves, one of the, I shouldn't say slaves, he saw one of the Tiano. Uh, they had bruises on them. So Columbus said that was what he wrote back in his first letter, that when he asked them, it's funny, he asked them what, the, what those marks came from, he, they told him that other uh, people from other islands in the Bahamas, because it's what the modern-day Bahamas, would come over and attack them. He took it as they must be trying to enslave these people. Now, I didn't make that up. Columbus wrote that. And his, his, he had the inceptious idea 
that we can conquer these people. We could come back here. And the first thing he asked for was gold. Now, he spent time in, 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 in Ghana. He understood Africans. He understood that there was gold over here in them parts. How do you discover something looking for spices when you get there, the first thing you want to know is, where's the gold? That's your first question. Where's the money? Because I was told money was over here. And later on, what he did was he went about subjugating those people in the second, third, and, and, and other voyages. We lie to each other and say that Africans have not been over here in the Americas before Columbus, but we have evidence of it and it shows it over and over and over again. A friend of mine sent me this sand hit off the coast of Mexico. And I was very happy when he sent this to me because this shows you what early American people, right? Saw as travelers who came over to the Americas. And one thing they wrote about was the lips, the nose. Not European. As they called it in those times, Negroid in nature. Those heads are centuries before Columbus. So, every year we go about celebrating Christopher Columbus and we go about talking about how he discovered this land and brought about these amazing changes. Oh, Columbus was exactly a conqueror. Columbus came over with the idea to conquer. Nephew, when he left from the Americas the first time, the next year, he went over, he didn't go right back to Spain. He went to Portugal. He brokered a deal with the Portuguese, right? That the Spanish, the Castile, the, the, the crowd of Castile and the Portuguese would draw up a treaty with the representation of the Vatican called the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Treaty of Tordesillas basically split the world in half and said Spain could have all of this over here by the Bahamas, but the Portuguese would have all of the rest. That is important. And why does this play into African-American history? Because what wound up happening is the Portuguese had the lock because of that treaty on the slave trade of Africans. But we know that they knew that darker skinned indigenous people in the Americas survived better by disease and other things that the Spanish brought over. So we have documented history that they knew that they survived longer. But we also know that African slave trade had already started toward the East in the Muslim world. It wasn't seen in the same trade as what was done on the Western side later on. It was more a, uh, uh, um, being a servant and earning your indentured sort of way of getting out in the old way that slavery had been done. Not acceptable by today's times, but at least you weren't chattel. But when Columbus came over, they forced the people into the Incomedia system and made the indigenous people their slaves, their subjects. And when they had died, after almost wiping those people out, go read about the Tiana. That was a genocide. A hundred years after Columbus's arrival, there were no more of them. But we also know that this is probably something that was thought about ahead of time because of the Essential de Negro, A S I E N T O, de Negro, which was passed in 1479 in Spain and basically said that people of darker skin could not be educated own property. 
So we know some of this was very much about conquering, conquering. We call these things the doctrine of discovery, right? We look at the Intercatera that allows people to be called savages. And it was, was given by, it was a papal bull by the Catholic Church that said that anyone who was outside of the Catholic Church was savage and should be killed, raped, or destroyed if they did not accept the guidance of the church or its agents, a.k.a. Columbus, or the conquistadors later on. It was a conquering mentality. And it should also be known that the Portuguese, who were the leaders in the slave trade for the better part of 400 years, did not fully abolish slavery until 1909. 1400, 1909. When we celebrate people like Columbus, we ignore our history. We ignore uh, who we are. We tell lies. We accept myths. I told you today would be a teaching session and that I would give you information. And it's information that a lot of people don't want you to know. It's information that people would challenge. And I'm going to put references in here like I always do for you to challenge back. When you read your history books and they tell you something about Columbus, when they tell you something about Magellan, Prince Henry the Navigator, and you hear about all of these men who supposedly discovered something, I hope today you think back on this episode and understand the lie of that the lie of that these men came over into the Americas and they were required to read a doctrine because because the Spanish crown was considered to be the Catholic crown Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand II were Catholic rulers they took their call from the Catholic Church they also should be said to remember that they are also the, the, the rulers who kicked the, the, the Moors, dark-skinned people, out of the Iberian or this the Spanish coast just a year before Columbus set sail to the Americas. So when we look at everything that was being done and how it leads up to that history that I gave you earlier, step by step, and the hidden nature of history. You understand now why we still hide our history. Why it's still being uh, presented. I had a conversation with a historian a couple of years ago. And he said, Eddie, I hear you say that all the time. Why do you say that uh, black history is hidden? And, and, and I get what you're saying. With the, I said, because let me, let, let, let me, let's pull it to today's society. If you are white, not to be racist, and I tell you that this discovery and that discovery and this discovery and that thing and this thing was done by somebody who does not look like you. Many of us don't want to accept that because we feel like we're not connected to that. But what did we do? I remember when I look at my son who watches uh, he loves the, the, the Spider-Man with Miles because he looks like him. There is a connective ideal here that people systemically in a system worked to keep hidden and still work to keep hidden. There's a reason why a majority of our historians who seem to often uncover some iota hidden in black history are white. History is not stolen. It has been hidden. It has been improperly taught. It continues to be improperly taught. And we have to be smarter and dig deeper. Look at what's obvious to us 
as we talked about how you go into India and they've already been there. How you circumnavigate in the globe when you already have maps that you obtained by the Turks or the Muslims. How are you doing any, how are you uh, creating iron and copper and all of this when centuries before we have evidence that it was done in other places in Africa and now what you call the Middle East because you had to separate that black and brown man. I talk about where you had ventured to. There is a lot to unpack. And I wanted you to think about this as we go further and looking at Columbus Day. Ask some of these questions before we check off. That's true. There's a lot of things that are that they're not they're, they're taught, but not properly taught. School should be about challenge. I try to make the interactive for you all to challenge a thought, ask a question. That's what should be happening. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you share this episode. This was a lot to unpack. Unfortunately, a lot of times, um, I get frustrated with erudition because I, I try to do lessons like this where we teach, but then I try to touch and do other things to keep people involved, interested, wanting to see and wanting to learn. But there's so much if misinformation out here, so much of it. And I find it hard. I encourage everybody who was viewing today, share, share, share. I cannot say that enough. The information I provided you today comes from years of study. Not off the top of Eddie's head, not making up anything. Years of study, reading, looking deeper, and try to pass that on to you to do the same. Please support the Erudition Network. We don't necessarily ask for your buddy, even though you see that cash app down there. And I'm not discouraging you from helping us. But we do need your support. Church folks, not church folks. I send out posts. I try to get people involved. Please help us to get more of our young people involved. A lot of people who are not watching this episode live Hopefully we'll watch it as a replay. But I know a lot of what I put out today is not no. It's there. But as 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 WB Du Bois said, right? It's a veil that you can't really see fully out of. You see little bits. Little bits. It's a veil. It's not easy. Carter G. Woodson, uh, is an encouragement to me. It's the father of black history buff. Because one of the things that he said was, it's worth it. It's worth it to give your life in the education of your people. And I mean all people. That knowledge was given here by God for a reason. And we need to share it. We're coming up to the end of this hour. This has been a really great session and I really appreciate everybody who uh, was with me live. See, my mom was here. Thank you, mom. It, it's, a, it's a labor of love to do this. And I really, really encourage you, uh, as my mother just said, share, share. Let us grow, let us learn together. All right, I started a little bit late, but I ended just about within the hour or a time. Thank you, everybody. There will we will be doing a program this weekend. There may be some things on your edition this weekend that will talk more about Columbus, uh, not just this episode as we approach the holiday. So I ask you again: Will you see those things pop? Share, share, share. And if you have any questions even after the episode, feel free to put it in the chat. I try to answer them, and you will get my references and my books 
of where you can read and learn some of this information for yourself. Knowledge is not to be held and kept captive. It is to be shared. All right. I love you all. I thank you so much for spending the time for me. And you all have a blessed and wonderful rest of your day. Share this episode, rather it be YouTube or rather it be Facebook. Like us, uh, subscribe to us or, 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 or YouTube and like us on Facebook. My son will kill me if I don't say that. But I thank you all. Have a good one.